Okay, hello, good afternoon, welcome to this uh, Howison Lecture. I, I'm John Campbell, I'm a professor in the philosophy department here at Berkeley, and I'd just like to welcome you here. So this series of lectures commemorates George Holmes Howison. Uh, when he was 50, um, in 1884, Howison took the first endowed chair in philosophy at Berkeley, and he built the philosophy department here. He was clearly a charismatic and much loved individual. And on his death, um, his friends and colleagues put together a fund that is paying for today's lecture, even now, to continue Howison's work, to bring the most distinguished and influential thinkers of the day from the great metropolitan centers out here to the rural wilderness of <laughs> California. Um, I, I like to think that um, as one of the leaders of that colorful group, the St. Louis Hegelians, um, Howison would have greatly approved of the choice of Beatrice Longines as our speaker today. Um, Beatrice was educated at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, at the Sorbonne, also in Paris, and at Princeton in um, Princeton. Um, her, her first book, uh, Kant and the Capacity to Judge, uh, published in 1998, was instantly acclaimed as a, a remarkable contribution it was an extended uh, meditation on, 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 among other things, Kant's remark that the categories originate in the logical functions of judgment. Uh, somewhat dizzying, but if, if I may say so, but um, really deep and important subject. Um, and her book really changed how people were thinking about it. Her second book, Kant and the Human Standpoint, um, further developed her view, responded to criticisms, and deepened and extended it. And in Hegel's critique of metaphysics, she went uh, back to her dissertation work and took on the task of explaining the relations between Kant and Hegel. Um, so this is a background in the very deepest metaphysics. And um, her 2017 book, I, Me, Mine, back to Kant and back again, really expanded the canvas. It looked at self-consciousness and I thinking, how we think of our, our, ourselves as people, um, and uh, uh, looked at contemporary debates about self-consciousness in the light of these background ideas. On Beatrice's view, the Kantian I think relates to the awareness of our own activity in binding together representations into thoughts, that um, a thought is the product of some activity involving the binding of represent various representations into a single object, and then saying something about that object, binding the whole lot together into a single thought. And the I in the I think is thought of as um, a reflection of one's own capacity for that kind of intellectual activity. She tried to avoid the idea of Kantian transcendental subjects and compared the I to Freud's ego and the moral I to Freud's superego. Harvard's Matt Boyle uh, said in Mind, one is not likely to find a more illuminating guide to modern theories of the self and self-consciousness and Kant's spe special place among them than this important book. Our Spinoza lectures at the University of Amsterdam, uh, The First Person in Cognition and Morality, were published in 2019. Um, I'm full of expectation. I really can't wait to hear what is coming for us today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Longines. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. Thank you also for the invitation to give this year's Howison Lecture. I'm deeply honored, deeply honored by the invitation, and thank you all for being here. 
So I wanted to check the time. I see I don't have my phone. I do. OK. Shortly before coming to Berkeley to give this lecture, I was asked to sign a consent and release form, which read like this. I'm, going to read, I'm not going to read the whole form, just the, the beginning of each sentence on the form. I am a presenter speaker for the above event, the above event being the Howison Lecture in Philosophy with Beatrice Longanes. I understand the event will be videotaped and recorded. There follows the list of uses that could be made of the recording. I give my permission and authorize the university to videotape, audio tape, and follows the whole list of uses it could make of it. I declare I have read the above and I fully understand the meaning and effect. I agree to be bound by it. And then there's a space to sprint, to, to sprint, to print my name. There's a space to give the date and then the space for signing in person. So that it is quite clear that the person who says I agree, et cetera, et cetera, is the person named Beatrice Longanes who has attested to this by signing her own name. We all have many, many instances we, where we thus have to attest, I agree to this, this, and that, and then to sign our name. Here's the best of them in my case. As a French citizen picking up French retirement benefits for the time I taught in France, whereas I now live in the US, I have to sign every year, I kid you not, a certificate of existence. <laughs> a certificate that I exist. Signed in front of a notary public. It's true, I'm not inventing it. I, Beatrice Longanes, attest that I exist. It is important that the person who says I exist is the person whose name is Beatrice Longanes as attested by the government issued ID I have to bring to the notary public and I have to sign in front of the notary public so that he can attest that the person who signed is the person named Beatrice Longanes and the person who says I exist, etc., etc. I won't give you any more examples. But we do all have to make at some point those kinds of statements in the first person. Why? After all, if I wrote Beatrice Longanes pledges and then signed, we would know that one person pledged and signed. It would give enough information. Why do we have this device, which everyone uses? In that sense, it's universal, but uses only to refer to the person she herself is. In that sense, it's singular. Whereas the name is only singular, maybe Maybe there are other Beatrice Longanes, in which case I would have to give some definite description that specifies which I'm talking about, but basically I could use just the name. There are countless attempts, both in the history of philosophy and in contemporary philosophy, to address these questions and this puzzlement. Why on earth do we have this extra device, the first person pronoun? I don't think any of them fully exhausts the question. I don't think mine will either. Obviously, there are many different angles under which one might address the question. What I intend to do in this talk is to consider two ways of addressing it, which I will argue are quite different, but mutually illuminating. I call the first way Anscombe's way, because in, print, in presenting it, I'm inspired by a famous paper by Elizabeth Anscombe, The First Person, published in 1975. And I call the second way Sartre's way, because it is inspired by Jean-Paul Sartre. The texts I will be appealing to in his case are The Transcendence of the Ego, 1937, and Being and Nothingness, 1943. In both cases, I'm going to be selective in the particular arguments I borrow from them, and I will use those arguments to my own ends. The first way, Anscans, addresses the question from the standpoint of language analysis. What do we do with I in language, or more generally, what do we do with the first person in language and in thought? The second way, Sartre's way, addresses the question from the standpoint of 
what we call, and he calls, phenomenology. And I don't mean by the, the school of phenomenology, but just a method which consists in the description of our experience of the world and of ourselves. Insofar as the first person I comes into his investigation, the question is, what are its place and its role in the expression of our experience of the world and of ourselves? The two types of questions are clearly not foreign to one another. Indeed, I think there is quite a bit of phenomenology in the sense I just explained, uh, especially in the solution Enscom offers. And surprisingly enough, there is quite a bit of language analysis, although not as rigorous as we might like, but it does play a role in Sartre's phenological descriptions. So my first part, the, the, the plot for the paper is quite simple. My first part will be Anscombe's way. My second part will be Sartre's way. And I will end with a few conclusions about how, what lessons we can draw from their cross-pollination in some way. So I start with Anscombe's way. That's point one on your handout. I am skipping the little story about Oedipus, uh, on which I had an nice land of my own. But for lack of time, I go directly to a thought experiment Anscombe coins, which essentially is clarifying the kind of point I was trying to make with Oedipus. The thought experiment is the following. So I go directly to 1-1, one, one, a thought experiment. A users and I users. And the experiment is this. Imagine a population in which each individual has two names. One consists in a letter of the alphabet, printed on the top of their chest and their back so that they can see it, but other people can see it, which others can see and which other, others use to designate them to convey information about them, the person who has those names on her chest and on her back, so that they learn to respond to that name just by the fact that others call them by that name and call upon them by that name. But the other name is the letter A, the same name for everyone, just like our I, the same name for everyone, printed on each person's wrist, so that each person alone, at least in the normal case, there can be slips where you catch a glimpse of someone else's wrist, but in the normal case, you see your own wrist and no other. And so when other people, for instance, would call me B, I would call the person I am A. And I would learn that the person I call A is the person other people call B. There's clearly a similarity between the duality of names, a name A, which everyone uses only for themselves, and the names B, C, D, and you can go to the end of the alphabet and then to another alphabet, as many as you need, which are public names which are used by others. There's a similarity between that case and our duality of terms, one which is I, which each of us uses only to talk about themselves, and the public name, which we have learned is our name because other people call us that way. Perhaps first our parents call, it that, call us that way. And so it is tempting to say, just like A, in our imaginary population is a name everyone uses to talk about themselves. I, in our own population, is a name every, each of us talks about ourselves. And this is how Anscombe wraps up her story. That's C1 on your handout. In my story, we have a specification of a sign, A. That's, we're talking about the A population here, not the I population, which we are. In my story, we have a specification of a sign as a name, the same for everyone, but used by each to speak only of himself. How does it compare with I? And there she says, the first thing to say, to note, is that our description of the A users does not include self-consciousness on the part of the people who use the name A, as I have described it. But then she goes on to say, but it's a weird thing to say that they don't have self-consciousness. After all, B, who uses A, 
is conscious, that is to say, he observes some of B's activities, that is to say, his own. He uses the term A, as does everyone else, to refer to himself. So he's conscious of himself. So he has self-consciousness. And again, she replies, but when we speak of self-consciousness, we don't mean that. We mean something manifested by the use of I as opposed to A. Now, this last sentence, like the previous one, has a suspicious air of circularity. We want to know the difference between our fictitious population of A users and the population of I users, the population we are, and we're given the reply, well, I users, not A users, only I users have self-consciousness. But now we want to know what self-consciousness is, and the reply is, well, it's what I users have, and A users don't. How is this an explanation? Well, it's not. It's just a statement of an intuition we have about the case at hand. The I users report about their own whereabouts on the basis of observation, testimony, and inference, the very same sources of information they have about the whereabouts of other people. They observe that the body that carries the letter A that's written only on their own moves. They can infer from what other people say that something happened to that body, and so on and so forth, just like they would do for other people. The only difference is that the name A happens to apply in each case to the person who reports the whereabouts of A. Being conscious of themselves in Anscombe's wrapping up assessment is just observing themselves, making inferences about a person who is themselves, signaled by the letter on their wrist, which they alone can see, and hearing testimony about the person they happen to be, called by others, let's say, in my case, B, and which they call A. But on the other hand, there is this particular source of information specific to I, or the I user, self-consciousness. If we want to get out of the circle, the circle is explaining the difference between I users and A users by saying that the first, not the second, have self-consciousness, and then explaining self-consciousness as what the I users have. If we want to get out of that circle, we need to know what self-consciousness is. And then we will know what we do when we report beliefs about the person we are based on that particular source of information, self-consciousness. And this is indeed what Anscombe goes on to do, offering a first explanation of what self-consciousness might be, and correspondingly, what kind of word, with what function in our language and thought, I is. But that first explanation collapses, both as an explanation of self-consciousness and as an explanation of the role of I. And so she offers a second explanation, which this time does not start from self-consciousness, but starts from what an I thought is. And by I thought, she means a thought in which I, the word I, but then in thought, the concept I, occupies the position, apparently, of subject. And then you can apply predicates to that subject. She starts from that. And from there, it seems, emerges a new notion of self-consciousness. We've taken things in the reverse order. So I will get to her solution, of course, but before getting to her solution, it is worth lingering on the first explanation, the one that collapses, for two reasons. It does have a long history in the history of philosophy. And whether we realize it or not, it is a very tempting way in which we sort of apply in everyday life to think about I. So I start with the first explanation, which starts with self-consciousness. And the question is, what is self-consciousness? Well, one tempting response, which seems very natural, is, is the consciousness of a self. But what is a self? Well, it's what one is to oneself. So there's the person called B, whom everyone can see and make judgments about and draw inferences about, and then, there is this much more secret aspect of me, 
What people see is the outside me. But there is an inside me, which I alone have access to. And the discrepancy would exist between the outside me and the inside me I'm so intimately aware of at every aspect of life. For instance, even some common situation like this. B, do you want to go to the movie? And I say, yeah, I would like to go to the movie. With this reply, I alone know the flow of associations that go with my replying. I would like to go to the movie. The flow of associations, feelings, expectations, hopes, fears, what happened the last time I went to the movies, and so on. So other people do see me as the person who wants to go to the body, we'll go together to the movie. But there's something much deeper in me about what it means to so much want at this time to go to the movie. Of course, I can tell it to others. I can start telling about my associations. It's never going to be sufficient to get to the deep me that is the one who wants to go to the movie. I know it from the inside. And this goes for everything, for something even more commonsensical as, this is a tree out there. And we all agree. We could, oh yeah, people are wrong. Yeah, this is a tree. And I will reinforce my statement by saying, I know this is a tree because I see it. Now, the experience of seeing the tree is just mine. And other people will also say, yeah, I know this is a tree because I see it. And their experience is there. So there's the common world on which we can agree. But then there's, for each of us, the internal experience in virtue of which we see that world. So we could say, being a self, is the, in, and then we will explain self-consciousness, being a self is being the kind of entity that does not only report about the world or act on the world or react to the world in ways everybody else can see, but is aware of her own reaction to the world and of the fact that that awareness is absolutely singular. That's what makes us a self. So there's me as the very public persona, whom everybody, including that persona herself, knows by her public name, like the air users know themselves in the way other people know them. For the others, their public name, for the air user, in the same way, but with, by that name that she alone sees. And then for us, our users, there is myself, what I'm most inwardly. And we do often protest. That's why I say it's a very common experience. But that's not me. The way I'm, de the way I'm depicted, the way others see me, but also perhaps the way I have acted out, what I, what I get other people to see of me, that's not me. I know that's not me. That's the basis on which I make such statements is I alone know what the true me is, namely myself. And so I want to add, and maybe I won't spend too much time on this because I think I'm already going a bit over, but I do want to mention that the philosopher who most forcefully introduced that notion of a self is John Locke in the 17th century. Here's what he said. Do you have the text T2 on your handout? You can meditate on it at home. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to read a few sentences of it. Here's what he says. When we see, hear, smell, taste, sensory and sort of affective experiences, but also when we meditate, like Descartes, the pure form of thinking, or when we will, our thinking is directed to agency, anything, we know that we do so. Thus, it is always as to our present sensations and perceptions, and by this, everyone is to himself what he calls self. It not being considered in this case whether the same self is continued in the same or in diverse substances. So there's the self, which one is to oneself in virtue of all of those mental activities he's just listed, and then there's the substance, whatever the substance is, and the identity condition of the two are not going to be the same. And he goes on to say, that's when I'm, I'm skipping a bit, he says, as far as his consciousness can be extended backwards in any past action or thought, so far reaches the identity of that person. It is the same self now as it was then. For him, person and self are the same thing, and they are different from the human being, which has its own conditions of 
identity at different times. So for Locke, there is what I am as an entity located in space and time, a human being, namely a living thing, moving through the world, performing actions, expressing feelings, talking. But then there is what I am to myself, a self, conscious of our own motion, actions, feelings, willing, and so on. The two in most normal circumstances overlap enough that I sort of consider them as the same. When the living body moves, the person who is a self to herself is aware of its motion. When the body is hurt, the self experiences hurt in this inward way, and so on. The motions and actions of the body that the body has performed in the past, the self remembers having experienced in the past. A present self experiences its own identity with the past self in virtue of experiencing being now the self that remembers the very experiences the past self experienced, and so on. So in normal cases, we think, okay, well, you know, they overlap, that's, that's okay. But in many cases, the identity at different times of the self and the human being or the living entity um, don't overlap. I may remember as mine, as experiences I myself had experienced, which no event confirmed. We all know about false memories. It's a phenomenon that now is very widely um, studied. So no event in the past, in the objective biography of the human being, supposed to have lived through the corresponding lapse of time, confirms what I seem to remember as something I have done, which to me says something about what and who I am. Locke actually bit that bullet happily. And he says that, well, the identity of self is just not the same as the identity of the human being. If the individual who in the past world is a prince now has all and only the memories of the cobbler who was mending shoes by the side of his palace and continues to have all and only the experiences of the cobbler, then as a self, he's the cobbler. Well, as a human being, which includes his biological and social identity, he's still the prince. So you will have um, a very befuddled cobbler who finds himself bowed to by courtiers and thinking, what is he doing? There's a complete, so of course this is a case, imagine, by Locke himself saying, biting, yeah, right, no, they'd be fine. There's the self, and then there's the human being. This raises all sorts of paradoxes about responsibility, moral accountability, and so on, which Locke delighted in discussing. But without going into those issues, one can ask, even granting his notion of the identity of self as distinct from the identity of man, where do we have a criterion for the identity of self itself? How do we know that our present recollection of a past experience is indeed a recollection rather than a fantasy? And the identity of self is supposed to be the identity of the current recollecting self with the self which actually experienced the recollected experience. But how do we know that? In fact, whether our current being self to oneself is identical to any past being self to oneself, nothing guarantees it which is different from the human being, of course, because there, there's space and time, there's a public discourse, others can confirm or disconfirm. We know what footing we're on, but with the self, we don't. And so we're stuck with the idea, well, maybe the self is limited to an instantaneous being self to oneself. And actually, some people, you know, philosophers are capable of defending any view, and there are some people who defend that view. Yeah, the self is just instantaneous. But even if you say that, where's the limit? Where, you know, where do you get to the actual instant where the self, how is there not a composition of selves in what we think is an instant and so on? There's no criterion. Now to this notion of self and self-consciousness as consciousness of a self corresponds a way of characterizing the word I, and it's different from A. That's why it's so tempting, because you can say, that's one three on the handout, I as the name of a self. You can say just as A in our fictitious population is a name 
the same for everyone, by which each A user refers to the person she, in fact, is, while other people refer to her by using other names, different for each individually. Similarly, I is a name, the same for everyone, but this time, by which each I user refers to her self, herself, namely her self, as we have just characterized it in saying conscious self-consciousness is conscious of a self. The difference with A is that the self is accessible only to the I user, whereas the entity the A user refers to using the name A is the very same entity referred to by another name, the public name used by everyone else. We were wondering what makes I different from A. Well, that's what it is. A is a name, the name for everyone, with the same for everyone, which refers to the person who sees A on the wrist. A is a name, the same for everyone, that refers to the self, which each person has access to in virtue of being aware and being alone aware of her own seeing, willing, etc. But all the difficulties we encountered in identifying what that self might be beyond an instantaneous subjective object, those difficulties also hold for the idea of a self as what I refers to or is a name for. And we'll have the same difficulty occurring if we try to define I as a demonstrative, referring to what? The self? Because it can be to this body, then it would be just A but the same difficulties and others and more occur again. And so Anscombe's, in a way, perfectly reasonable conclusion is, well, it's just a mistake to think that I refers to anything at all. We cannot say it refers to the body. We've lost the difference between I and A. We cannot say it refers to a self because we, there's no way of identifying a self as an object. So we have to figure out something else to be the role of I. And so that's why the, the, one of the most striking statements in the paper, which I find great, but really mind-boggling, is, well, this means that I am Elizabeth Anscombe is not an identity proposition. It is not a proposition that asserts that when said by Elizabeth Anscombe, A, oh, sorry, I, <laughs> I refers to the very same entity which the name Elizabeth Anscombe refers to, which would be what an identity proposition is. You have two terms. They refer in different way to the same entity. And it seems to stand to good sense that when Elizabeth Anscombe says, I'm Elizabeth Anscombe, I refer to Elizabeth Anscombe, and Elizabeth Anscombe refers to Elizabeth Anscombe. When I say I'm Beatrice Longuenesse, I refer to Beatrice Longuenesse, and Beatrice Longuenesse refers to Beatrice Longuenesse. That's the point of those forms I signed. So even though the reasoning is really very powerful, you can, we really cannot get your mind around the conclusion. But still, now we want her positive proposal to see why well, she does have a solution to offer. So she starts by giving examples, which you have on the handout just under, I think, 1-4, but I'm not going to look at the examples just now. I'm going to look at them a bit later. I'm going to go directly to, OK, so. What is the alternative account of I she has to offer? And she has several, which amount to the same, and I'm, I'm giving only two which I find the most salient, the most striking. That's T3 and T4 on your handout. I thought, so I thought, again, are thoughts in which I functions as logical subject and something, I am F, F, I'm standing, I'm running, uh, I'm sad, uh, I'm thinking, are predicate of that logical subject I, and correspondingly in language, I is the grammatical subject, and then there's an attribute to the subject. OK, so I thought, so defined. I thoughts are unmediated conceptions, unmediated conceptions, knowledge or belief, true or false, of states, motions, etc. And then she continues, of this subject here, and that's how we're supposed to understand it of this object here, of which I can find out, so she would say, if I don't know it, that is Elizabeth Anscombe. <coughs> People have called her so many times Elizabeth Anscombe, she has to know she's Elizabeth Anscombe. And about which I did learn, that's what we learn in biology classes or in reading Aristotle, that it is a human being. That's her first, her first characterization. Of course, I will comment on it, but that's the first characterization.
The second characterization is some at the very end of the paper, and unfortunately I cannot comment on the circumstances in which it appears. Uh, maybe it'll come up in, in the discussion. The second characterization is I thoughts are unmediated, we have again the unmediated, agent or patient conceptions of actions, happenings, and states. And there's not any more in this object here or in, in this body here. There's just agent or patient conceptions of actions, happenings, and states. So here's what we're supposed to understand, at least as I understand it. I thoughts, thoughts expressed in the first person with I as the logical subject of the thought, or in language, the grammatical subject of the corresponding sentence, are thoughts about an object, that's what T3 says, but where the information about the object is not obtained by observation, inference, or testimony, as in ordinary thoughts about objects, and as in the I thoughts considered in the thought experiment I started with, the information is obtained in virtue of being the object in question, and perhaps experiencing being the object in question. This is what she calls unmediated conception of states, motions, etc., of this object here, or in T4, even more tellingly, agent or patient conceptions of actions, happenings, and states. Unmediated, because not mediated by observation, inference, or testimony, and agent or patient conceptions, because they are had in virtue of being in the state asserted in the proposition. Now, in all the examples, we go back to the beginning of the examples I gave just under 1.4, in all the examples, you note that the statements she cites, except for the last one, I will go somewhere or other, they, sp they statement about a body, their asser assertions of bodily states. I, I jump, I have an itch, I run, whatever. But the assertion, and that's why there's this object here, but the assertion is made not from the point of view of an observer, but from being in the state asserted by proprioception, I'm sitting, by intention, I will go. At the same time, the statement is about the body, this body here. That the statement is made from the point of view of being in the state described is what is expressed by I, but at the same time, the statement can be verified or falsified only by observing this body here. So here on the handout, you have a series of objections, and I'm going to skip the second, but I think I'm going to go through the first, because I think it, it at least trying to go through these objections and responding to them clarified for me what she had in mind. But I'm, not, I'm going to skip the second, which intro introduces more complex issues. So, objection. So she says, we, we don't need to ask what I refers to. It doesn't refer. It's just the fact that it, the information is acquired not by observation, but by being, and perhaps being namely experiencing, but even not necessarily, just being in the state. That's what's expressed by I. And so one objection is, why then not say that I refers to this body here? It's this body here that is itching, sitting, disposed to go. When I say I'm sitting, I'm itching, I intend to go, and so on. Anscombe might reply, that's what I'm trying to invent in her place. Maybe she would have a better reply. This would take us back to the question, how does I differ from A, which clearly refers to the body? Rebuttal of that reply, well, I does differ from A in that it refers to this body, yes, but not from observing this body, but from being this body. Anscombe's rebuttal of the rebuttal, but we also think I thoughts while having no information whatsoever about the body, and which assert states that are not states of the body. If we say that I refers to the body, we have no way of accounting for those cases of I thoughts. For instance, we can imagine, that's a very famous thought experiment she offers at various stages in the paper, we can imagine someone in sensory deprivation tank absolutely no sense of her body. Not by external sense, not by interoception, no thing, nothing whatsoever, no information whatsoever. 
coming from the body. That's the thought experiment. So the sensory deprivation tank goes all the way down, as it were. But she could still think, I'm in a dreadful situation. What shall I do? And that does not involve the body. She's capable of accounting of something going on, some mental state, some mental attitude going on, of which there is being in that state information also going on. And that's what's expressed by I. Similarly, more common cases, the so-called, what she calls the Cartesianly preferred cases, where we just ascribe to ourselves mental states. We don't need to be aware of our body to ascribe to ourselves those states. Th there's a famous story in, in Plato, Thales, who was thinking so hard about geometry that he fell into the well. And the servant had a good laugh at Thales. And now he has to become aware of his body, of course. But while thinking about geometrical proof, there was, he didn't need to think about his body. But he was using I, saying, oh, I think that's right. Or I'd better think about that proof again. I is the expression of being oneself engaged in putting together a proof, testing a proof, and so on. So it's better to say agent or patient conception of states, conception of states from the standpoint of being in those states rather than observing those states. And sometimes we just have no answer to the question, in what thing? Are those states verified or falsified? Which is something she said. I think that that is a problem of her view, actually. But that, that, yeah. In the case of the sensory deprivation, or in the pure cases of Cartesianly preferred cases, as I think about thinking, there has to be something that's in those states. But the I is not expressing an aware of that something, but just an awareness of being in those states. Okay. My second objection, I'm skipping, and I go directly to my introduction of why it's interesting to think about um, Sartre's way. First of all, um, taking stock. My suggestion is that she's on the right track by rejecting the idea that I refer to a special object, the self, defined as a special internal object. She's on the right track by insisting that what is characteristic of I thought is the standpoint expressed, not an observer standpoint, but an, what she calls an agent or patient standpoint, which I'll call a standpoint of just being in the state, which may be a state in which I'm implementing the state or a state in which I'm acted upon. That's what she calls the patient uh, information. Um, but it is unnecessarily complicated is what I'm suggesting to claim that when I say I'm Elizabeth Anscombe, I'm not saying that an entity referred to, supposing I'm Elizabeth Anscombe. So I'm, I'm identifying momentarily with Elizabeth Anscombe. Suppose I'm Elizabeth Anscombe. When I say I'm Elizabeth Anscombe, it's unnecessarily complicated to say that it's not true that an entity referred to by I is the very same as the entity referred to by Elizabeth Anscombe. Just as in the form I had to sign, I, the undersigned, refers to the person who signs and who is, as it happens, the person referred to by the name Beatrice Longaness as the notary public can attest. Now, both points, I thought are not thoughts about an object, a self. They express an agent or patient standpoint on something that remains to be identified are close to a position Sartre developed some 30 years before Anscombe wrote her celebrated paper. I'm not saying this to play the game of precedence or to gloat about the fact that a Frenchman had those thoughts. <laughs> I'm saying this just because if I'm right that there is a closeness between Sartre's and Anscombe's view, they are developed from very different standpoints. Language analysis with some phenomenology tossed in in Anscombe after all, her examples are very, very phenomenologically telling. And phenomenology with some language analysis tossed in, in Sartre. Most importantly, Sartre's starting point is not a puzzle about language. Sartre's starting point is a fact about us, that we are conscious. The uses of I in, his in its complexities is to be understood against the background of the different types of consciousness they are anchored in. And so I move to point two, Sartre's way. 
What time did I start? Do you have an idea when I started? Because I'm about halfway through, but it means I'm never, okay. So, Sartre's way takes its starting point from a more primitive phenomenon than language, consciousness. And so I want to start apologizing for the sort of detour through Sartre's own thought. Um, I start with at least a few indications about Sartre's conceptual toolkit to talk when he talks about consciousness. And the toolkit is consciousness, self-consciousness, and reflective consciousness. That will be the first point in this second part of the paper. Then I will uh, reflect on when does the use of I fit in the description of those phenomena. And third, since the point also did come up in, in Anscombe's um, reflection, but with a kind of unresolved point about the relation to the body, what is the relation between the I and the body, or if you like, between using I and the I user's consciousness of her own body? So first, consciousness, self-consciousness, reflective consciousness. Consciousness is a property we human beings have. Other beings may have it, what interests Sartre is human beings. Consciousness is a property we human beings have. In fact, we are most fundamentally conscious beings. Now, consciousness, as the fundamental property of the kinds of entities we are, has two aspects. The first is intentionality, which Sartre also calls positional consciousness or thetic consciousness. That's the kind of sort of jargon he inherits from the history of philosophy, and I'm going to go into that. When he says thetic or positional, he means intentionality, what we would call it, the directedness of the mental state or the directedness of the attitude of the individual that is in those states. The second is what we would call, I think, although there may be debate about that, but I think it's what we would call phenomenal consciousness. What it's like for the conscious creature to be conscious. He calls this second aspect, which for him is inseparable from the first, non-thetic or non-positional self-consciousness. I now consider each in turn intentionality or positional consciousness or thetic consciousness. Intentionality is the directedness of a mental state or mental attitude, the fact that it is of something, directed at something, perceiving is perceiving a tree, a car, the person in this room, and so on. Hating is hating someone or hating a situation. Thinking is thinking about something. All of these are conscious state in the sense of intentional states. Now, the entity which is in those states is conscious in the same sense. She's conscious of whatever object her attention is directed at in virtue of being in those states. The tree as the tree she's now perceiving, the person as the person she can't stand, the situation as the situation she would like to get out of, and so on. That's for thetic consciousness. Non-thetic, self in parenthesis to indicate it's not the consciousness of a self, According to Sartre, this second aspect is inseparable from the first. Being conscious that we are conscious, being aware of our own consciousness as intentionality is inseparable from that intentionality. If we were not aware of our mental states being directed at something, then those states would not deserve to be called conscious states. So I'm reserving the question whether there could be intentional states that are not conscious in this second sense. Sartre's term consciousness involves those two aspects, intentionality and the non-positional consciousness of, the of being in the intentional state itself. And again, in this second sense, consciousness is both an aspect or property of the state and of the creature who is in the state. To say that she's a conscious being is to say that she has mental states directed at the world, she has positional consciousness of objects in the world, she has intentionality, and it is to say that she's aware of her own intentionality, the directedness of her own mental states, and of being in those states. That's the phenomenal aspect. However, again, the second aspect of consciousness is not a second order intentionality directed at the first. 
There is a second order intentionality directed at the first. That's what Sartre calls reflective consciousness. I had something on the handout. I'm skipping that because I want to go. We will get back to reflective consciousness, this second order intentionality directed at the first. I'm going directly to the second point, which is, um, I think I'm going directly to that, which is where does I appear? Where does the use of I appear? That's 2-2 two, two on your handout. And here, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to borrow two examples from Sartre. I don't think they're excellent examples or excellently presented, but I still think it's important to consider them in the terms in which he offers them and to see how we can make sense of them and move on from them. The first example, I'm, I'm considering them in chronological first order. The first example I'm considering is a very famous example from Being and Nothingness, 1943. The second will be from The Transcendence of the Ego, 1937. So previous text, which maybe explains partly why it's kind of more wishy-washy in what it's saying. But I think there's another reason. So first I consider the example from Being and Nothingness. So the, um, you have the text. I'm not going to read the text. The example is... Counting cigarettes, not surprising for Sartre. Saint-Germain-des-Prés Paris was a place where people smoked a lot. So the example is counting. I count the cigarettes left in my packet, wondering, do I have enough for the rest of the day? Should I go buy other cigarettes? But I'm just engaged in the act of counting my cigarettes. I count, and I will eventually arrive at the number 12. The act itself, counting, is comes to be a definable, unified act when I get to its goal. I have figured out the number 12 as the property of this collection of cigarettes. So the aesthetic consciousness is directed at the cigarettes and at the number, which, in fact, there's another text where, where Sartre just talks about the numbers. Well, it's an abstract object. I can speak about number. It, it's an abstract object. The intentionality is directed at that. But at the same time, in order to get at that object, to have an intentional awareness, a directedness of my mental attitude at the object 12 as the property of the collection of cigarettes, I have to be counting them. And I have to not lose track of my act of counting them. So I have to be non thetically conscious my attention is not directed at the act of counting. If it was, I would stop counting. And maybe at some point I would stop, oh, I've lost track, let me start again. Oh yeah, where was I? Then I'm reflecting. But if my act is successful, I'm not reflecting on it, I'm going on with it, and I'm conscious of it non -thetically. And if someone comes into the room and asks me, what are you doing? I say, shh, I'm counting, and go on with my counting. So his point is, here, the phrase, I'm counting, is expressed not as the expression of a thetic consciousness of myself as counting, it's the expression of a non-thetic consciousness. Very much like Anscombe said, the use of I is really, the way to understand it is it's the expression of agent or patient conception of state's action, in this case, it's an action, the act of counting. Agent, it, the expression of an agent conception of counting without me, myself, being the object of consciousness as intentionality. And so I, I have identified four points in the text. I'm, I have not read the text, but I'll go quickly through the points since now I've summarized the situation. Uh, point one, I have aesthetic oppositional consciousness of the cigarettes and of their property. There are 12 cigarettes. This is an objective property in the world of objects. I have aesthetic oppositional consciousness of it. Two, meanwhile, I have a non-positional consciousness of, in parentheses, to indicate it's not intentionality, my act of counting. In fact, my positional consciousness of there being 12 cigarettes is inseparable from my non-thetic consciousness of counting. If I, lost, if I turn my attention back, I would lose track. And if I lost track of any of the steps in my act of counting, I could lose track of the number. In fact, I may be annoyed at the person who asks me the question. She's potentially distracting me 
distracting my attention from the cigarettes and their number to my act, which is not what I want to do. But in the case described, happily, this is not what happens. I'm just keeping counting. Three, you'll, you will see the identification of the points in the text if you want to go back to it. I reply, I'm counting immediately without reflecting, and my reply tracks all the previous instances of non-thetic self-consciousness that accompanied each step of the act of counting. I had to be non-thetically conscious that I was at one, and then at two, and then at three, and then at four. Otherwise, I would not get to the whole series. So there was all along a non-thetic consciousness which grows on itself, as it were, um, and starts conclusion, there is a pre-reflective cogito, a gentle consciousness of some mental act, which is the condition of the Cartesian cogito. Now, the Cartesian cogito, that's where we get to reflective consciousness. Descartes, in the second, throughout the first meditation, Descartes has reflected on each and every one of his mental acts and realized that he couldn't trust any of them. And in the beginning of the second meditation, he gets to, oh, wait a minute, but if I doubt each and every one of them as I should, I have no reason to trust them. At least there's this one thing I doubt. And if I doubt, I think. And if I doubt that I think, I'm still thinking. So I have this thing, I think. This is a reflective consciousness. He's, been re he's reflecting on acts that have been going on, including his current act of doubting. And it's this reflection that lands him. And of course, Sartre's view is that it's because it's a reflective consciousness that as a reflective consciousness, we, namely now we're directing our attention to act instead of doing them, then we can construct this object, which is a fictitious object. And there's a thing that has to be the thing that does the thinking. And that's Descartes' idea of a thing that thinks, namely a soul, which he will then go on reasoning, is distinct from the body. But if we're just doing the thing the eye just expresses, the agential concept, in this case, of being engaged in an act, without any object being represented, so much less a self. Um, OK, skipping again. So the important point here is that um, I said there's something very similar in Sartre's conception of I as expressing an unsynthetic conception, and Anscombe saying agent or patient conception of states, attitudes, or even just events going on somewhere. And there's also a similar suspicion with respect to the idea of an I or a self or an ego as the object of self-consciousness. Um, now I want to look at the other example I announced, which is the example from um, the transcendence of the ego, which involves this time the consciousness of a bodily agency. And actually, it does complicate matters. Um, so here's the case is, again, I'm doing something. Someone comes into the room. That's T6 on the handout, but you don't have to read it. Uh, I will go through the points. Uh, and, but first, I summarize the example. And someone, what are you doing? And I say, he gives two examples. I'm repairing the tire, or I'm hanging the picture. I'm trying to hang this picture. And he expands on the second example. I'm trying to, exp to, to hang the picture. And here's what he says. Um, first, where is thetic consciousness directed at? Thetic consciousness is directed at the picture to be hung. As an, object, as an object in the world. That's where my attention is directed at. And it's that goal that the picture be hung that unifies the act that's going on. But he also says, and this is where I th think he's a bit wishy-washy, he also says, my attention is also directed at the act, which is not what he said in the case of counting. And I think what he means is that, well, in the case of hanging the picture, you know, I do have to pay attention, for instance, to Perhaps my hand that's holding the nail, I'd better be aware where it is because I don't want to bang my hammer against the hand. Similarly, I have to be aware of how I'm holding that hammer so that I go in the right direction, that of the nail, not that of my finger, and so on. But at the same time, of course, what is it that is doing the act? It's the very same body that also is being watched 
as part of the causal chain, which starts with its goal, the picture is to be hung, and then you have a chain, you know, nail, hold with my finger, hammer, hold with my other hand, bang the nail, not hit my finger, and then maybe I'm standing on the ladder and I have to be in the right position and the, 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 the picture in the right place, close enough that I can now take it. There's all sorts of going on in my body that I have to observe, but at the same time, who is doing this? The body from a different standpoint. But does I refer to that body? Bizarrely, he says, and that's uh, da, 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 um, the point two, which you have on the handout. When I reply, I'm hanging the picture, I'm not directing my attention to some entity I call I. And there he puts it in, in italics. If I envisage the actions, I envisage the actions just in so far as they are done or to be done, not in so far as I am doing them. In so far as I'm doing them, I have non-thetic consciousness of them. And that's the third point, which is even stranger. In that sentence, I is an empty concept. Uh, he, say, he doesn't say just that. He says it's not just a, a mere syntactic form. It is an empty concept destined to be empty. That's what you have at the end of the text and which I identified as point three in the text. Nevertheless, I is not a mere syntactic form. It's an empty concept destined to remain empty. Now, a mere syntactic form is what I is for Enscombe. It is just a trick of our language that agent or patient conception is formulated using a first person pronoun. Does the use of the first person just indicate a switch in standpoint from an observational standpoint to an agent or patient standpoint on a state, action, or motion? But I should not be treated like an ordinary subject in a subject predicate proposition, which would be a concept referring to a particular object. Now, clearly, and Sartre does not know Enscombe's view. This book, and even more, The Transcendence of the Ego is written 30 years earlier, but clearly he was tempted by a similar view. When he says I is not a mere syntactic device, it's because well, it could be given the exp explanation I've given. It's just a syntactic device to express non thetic consciousness of being engaged in the action. But that's not what it is, he says. It's an empty concept. Uh, so, I think what this shows is that Sartre does not share Anscombe's suspicion with respect to the subject predicate model, but he does see the problem Anscombe is after and is trying to solve by saying, well, I just express agent or patient conception of states, events, actions, motions, and so on. And so because of that, Anscombe concludes it's, it's not a singular referring expression at all. In Sartre's term, I is an empty concept. There is something that is designated by I. When I say I'm hanging this picture, there is an object in the world in which the motions that together amount to hanging the picture can be observed, but that is not an object or the concept I. So, Sartre is closer to say there's one and the same thing which you will refer to in very, very different way, one by a concept that remains empty, but nevertheless plays an important role, if only to then become aware of the various identifications it could come to uh, define for itself in the world. So there is still some entity whose existence is indicated by the mere fact that I is in use. That's why Sartre is still willing to call I a concept, namely something that does function as a component in a proposition in which it functions as a logical subject of logical predicates, and where the subject refers to some individual entity, and the predicate asserts properties, acts, states, 
to be true of that individual. That's where the key difference is, I think, between Sartre's view and Anscombe's view. Why is, that Im why is it important, after all? Why, why should we care? Because th there's, there's a similar intuition in both cases, that if it is a referring expression, it's really of a, of a very unique kind. And that leads me to my third point in the second part, the body passed over in silence. In the concluding section of an important chapter of being in nothingness, the body, Sartre has this striking formulation in non-thetic self-consciousness, the body is passed over in silence. Le corps est passé sous silence. That's not really a satisfactory equivalent. In it. Yeah, it's passed over. It's, it's left in silence. We are silent about it. Non-thetic self-consciousness is silent about it. Now, we can see what he may mean in the case of the non-thetic consciousness of counting expressed in the pre-reflective statement, I count, or I'm counting. This is the expression of a mental act which one knows to be occurring in virtue of performing it. No bodily self-consciousness is involved unless perhaps I'm physically pointing to each cigarette as I pronounce, but even there I would be pointing to the cigarette, not to my finger that points. Um, for the same reason, in the case of hanging the picture, one can say in non-thetic self-consciousness of hanging the object. In, in, sorry, in the non-thetic consciousness of a hanging, the object of consciousness is the picture and also the parts of the body directly connected to the picture in the causal chain that ends in the goal being achieved. But then there are objects of thetic consciousness, parts of the chain, arm, hand, hammer, finger, nail, picture. In the non-thetic self-consciousness involved in the whole action, the body is passed over in silence, in non-thetic self-consciousness, every object, including the body that acts, insofar as it acts, is passed over in silence. That's the insight Sartre expresses when he says, even in the case of I'm hanging the picture, that I there is an empty concept. And yet, if I turn around and make consciousness itself, the ob namely non-thetic consciousness and its intentionality, if I make it itself the object of a second order intentionality, what I find, at least that's the claim, is that that conscious entity is a body. In both cases, namely the counting and the hanging the picture, a conscious body, namely a body having intentionality and non-thetic self-consciousness. This is true both for the entity that has non-thetic self-consciousness in counting and the entity that has non-thetic self-consciousness in hanging the picture. If the self as a mental entity was a mental construct for Sartre, namely a fictitious entity that may have its use, and in that sense, the view is not exactly the same as Enscombe, but it's something we should be suspicious of. On the other hand, the self-conscious body as the entity that thinks is not a construct. It's just an object in the world which has this peculiarity that on it, one can have an external observational standpoint or an unmediate agent of patient standpoint, a standpoint one has in virtue of being that body, in which case the body can be passed over in silence. Now, you might think I'm pulling a strange and unexpected, I, I hear by the silence, I think, that you do think I'm pulling a strange and unexpected rabbit out of my hat by suddenly saying that in reflecting on the act of counting and on the non-thetic self-consciousness involved in counting, or for that matter, even in thinking, the second order reflective thetic consciousness directs its intentional attitude at a body. Now, defending the point would necessitate going into more details of Sartre's mammoth book than I can do here, and maybe we can dis discuss some aspects of it in the Q&A. I will simply note that if the notion of an internal self is a fictitious construct, what Sartre calls a body, in this case, reflecting back on the consciousness and what the consciousness is and why it is what it is, what he calls body here is a body in situation. And that is not a mental construct. It's a self-conscious body that has learned various practices, including 
language, reasoning, and yes, counting. The reflection on the act of counting is a reflection on those various practices which always involve a body in situation, if only in the small size learning to count, which then proliferates into very abstract for the theorists of number, reflections on number. A body in situation that can and should be passed over in silence when intentionality is directed at an object which is not itself and which now the object about which I'm trying to think establishes its own norms for the correct type of reasoning that needs to be involved. But at some point in reflecting on what that, that act exactly is, I will go back to learning a practice and a new practice will involve the practice of a body in situation. That's the view. At least that's, that's what I can sort of endorse of the view and, and I'm willing to discuss. So taking stock. I've outlined significant points of convergence between the Enscombe way and the Sartre way. Those points of convergence include, first, the contrast between observational and non-observational standpoint on states, actions, and motions. Second, the claim that I thought are expressions of non-observational standpoint but can be connected to thoughts about the very same entity from the observational standpoint. Three, the criticism of the notion of an in intimate internal self, the Lockean self or Cartesian ego for Enscombe, the constructed I of reflection for Sartre, and fourth, the connection between I thoughts and knowledge of or consciousness of the body, although that connection is very different for Sartre and for Enscombe. And for Enscombe, at some point, it ends on no answer. And in Sartre, it does end on some kind of answer, although we may find it pretty complex to swallow. Now, one might think that there is not much of a difference between thinking like Enscombe, that I thoughts are agent or patient conceptions of states, motions, actions occurring in this object here, or in no object if none is available, and sa or no, no observable object if none is available, and Sartre's view that I thought are the expression of non-positional self-consciousness, propositions in which I is an empty concept according to the formulation of the transcendence of the ego. But there is a difference, which I think is meaningful. Adopting Sartre's view of I as an empty concept allows us at least to say that I in I thought does have a referential role, but in no other way than according to the rule. I refer to the I user, a rule that does not need to be reflected on in order to be used. It's just used. We learn to use the word in language and in thought according to that rule. And being capable of learning such a rule is actually quite an achievement. I submit that Sartre's approach building up from more primitive to more sophisticated experiences of being a conscious entity solves problems that were acknowledged but not really resolved when addressed in Anscombe's way. In particular, how to have a unified account of the agent conception of mental states, counting, and bodily states, sitting, jumping, hanging a picture. How to understand how one and the same entity can, have non, can be non-thetically conscious of, in parenthesis, itself and conscious of itself as an object in the world, namely have observational and non-observational standpoint on itself and its own actions. But on the other hand, revisiting Sartre's view of self-consciousness and I thoughts through the lens of Enskan's semantic analysis helps us be on our guard with respect to the grandiose metaphysical statements Sartre derives from his description of the emptiness of the concept I as the expression of non-thetic self-consciousness. In that sense, Enscombe's lesson to Sartre is at least as welcome as Sartre's lesson to Enscombe. Thank you very much. What about a third way? And that's the way of neuroscience. So before you start, could, could we ask that people tell us their names? Just Steve Glazer. What about a third way? And that's the way of neuroscience. Ah. 
because yeah. in the last 30 years, there's yeah. been an amazing amount of work that's been done about consciousness. Yeah. And language has zero to do with consciousness. We have babies who are conscious. We have hydroencephalic people who have no cortex. They're conscious. We yeah. have animals that are conscious. Yeah. We have people like Einstein who claim they think visually, not linguistically. Yeah. So th all these arguments have little to do with consciousness. Well, uh, sorry, I don't want to talk too soon. That's, that's your question? Well, it's more of Did a you comment. want to say more? Or should I, I don't, yeah, I want well, to so what would be your answer yeah. to all this? Well, that's exactly why I say it's interesting that Sartre does not start from language, but start from consciousness. And note that I introduced the use of I very late in the game. I completely agree with you. And that's something I did not discuss, how the two aspects of consciousness can dissociate. I do think we can have phenomenal consciousness, and you can have creatures who have phenomenal consciousness without intentionality. You can have also creatures, sorry? Creatures have intentionality. Well, you know, you can have, you can, I don't, I, so there I am not, I, I'm not going to claim the, the um, um, expertise of a specialist. But what, the only thing I want to, to stress is that that's exactly why I started with consciousness. And for instance, uh, the experiences that I often cited of the, 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 the little girl who had no cortex, but still expressed affective states. Of course, people debate about that. Some people deny that she has consciousness. I'm on the side of the people who say she did have consciousness. She had phenomenal consciousness, but she didn't have intentionality. It looks like, and, and certainly even for all of us, there are, I would say, states of affective consciousness that have no intention. Extreme pain just is its own thing. Ned Block defends the, the idea that orgasm has phenomenal consciousness and no intentionality. Uh, so that they can be dissociated is at least a possibility. And my answer to you is, yes, exactly. I think there's consciousness before there is language. And therefore, what we need to understand is where language comes to fit into the experience of consciousness, which is exactly one of the ways in which I thought Sartre's way does have something to teach with, to teach to um, the kind of extremely precise language analysis that's offered by Anscom. So I agree with you. Yeah, of course. And so as to neuroscience, yes, it also has, it has a lot to, to teach us. What I would say also, and I think that's one today extremely interesting aspect of neuroscience, is that to understand both consciousness and where propositional attitudes fit in and first-person propositions, we need not only cognitive neuroscience, we need affective neuroscience. And that might be part of the answer to Anscombe's problem, which he says at the end, I don't know on which object it could be verified. I think what she has in mind, and who would need to know much more about what a brain is to understand on what object is verified. And now we are beginning to know things about where it's verified. Although I suspect we still think, and I think that's what we should think, that the phenomena of consciousness and self-consciousness are still to this day much more complex and much more phenomenally rich than anything neuroscience tells us, even though, of course, it's very important, but neuroscience is We have a number of questions. We have a number of questions. I'll be passing around Including the, the heart problem, but I'll stop here. Yeah, including the heart problem, yeah. I didn't talk about it. You forced me to say something. I won't say anything more. OK. Oh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Sandra Duranti, Anthropology UCLA. Um, first of all, fantastic talk. I mean, you, you cover a huge amount, and there's a lot, obviously, you didn't say, because you know it, but you didn't say. So um, just two, two, two things. One is that, um, I mean, you didn't talk about intersubjectivity. So can you, hear, can you see me? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yes, okay. we, yeah. I didn't see where you were, sorry. So, um, so you didn't talk about intersubjectivity, so the question of the constitution of the eye from the point of view of the other, which yeah. is also for Sartre a big, yeah. big question. Um, so I'm not going to say anything about that, but, but, but uh, that's one point. The second point is that actually it, it relates to what was just uh, by the previous comment, which is um, 
is not to defend the, the fact that, I mean, I want to make the point that, um, well, full, full disclosure, I'm by training a linguist. So mm -hmm. now I'm going to say the next thing. So which is that it's not necessary to say that um, you need language for consciousness. But I'm, I, it's curious to me and interesting to me anthropologically mm -hmm. that the languages uh, of the philosophy that you talked about are languages where you need the I, the je. Mm -hmm. It's obligatory in finite sentences. You cannot have a, 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 no, I mean, a regular sentence without you know, the, 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 the subject pronoun. So it's how you pronounce that you need it, and if you have a first person, then you, you need to say. So I mean, I find it interesting historically and anthropologically that the, 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 there is what I would call even an obsession with this problem of the I, as opposed, as opposed with other kinds of problems. Yeah. Um, and by the way, it's also interesting, I'm, I'm sure curious what you think about that, well, that might be in a different lecture, about the fact that this, the French, and like German, doesn't have a word for mind. So. Anyway, there are things that go into this Doesn't direction. Does it have a word for mind? You don't have a word for mind. We don't? Oh, no. Mind. Mind. Yeah, no, you don't have it. <coughs> OK, so there were, there were several. I will say something about intersubjectivity, even though you're right. It was not my topic. Uh, and it's not a question Anscombe touches on, at least not in that paper. But, but I think your question is actually very important, including for what I did not say, but does sort of touch on what I said, namely, of course, if you say um, all you need to use I is the I rule, namely I refers in any instance of its use to whoever says, there's already intersubjectivity there, because it means that when you use I, you understand that anybody else who says I refers not to me, but to themselves. And that's something children have, to, there's some very funny, funny things that happen with small children, and they still haven't figured that out. So that itself is something to figure out. And it shows that learning I is learning not just me, but intersubjectivity. I completely agree with you. And that's not only a matter of language, it's a matter of theory, theory of mind, uh, recognizing other minds, and so on. So absolutely agreed. Um, um, and then you said what's striking is that in the examples given both by Anscombe and by Sartre, right. uh, So that's what well, that's what Anscombe denies, right? Ansk, the, the whole point, and that's, that is what I find perhaps the most interesting in what she does, namely in saying, don't suppose I refers, it's just an expression of what's really going on is something is going on. And in that sense, she completely agrees with the point of Lichtenberg, for instance, who says, we shouldn't say I think, we should say it thinks. Thinking is going on. That's what is really going on. Something is going on. Nevertheless, she adds, we, th there's a sense to using I because what it indicates is, for instance, that contrary to Lichtenberg's sort of bad-tempered suggestion, it's not that thinking is going on just like thundering is going on, because thundering is a process that does not involve subjectivity, whereas thinking is a process that involves the what it's likeness, not always, but very often. So, so uh, why was I saying that? Because, yeah, because you were wondering why I comes in. Well, because, and again, that's why I was careful to say at the beginning, okay, wait a minute. Keep in mind, the consciousness Sartre is talking about is human consciousness. That's what interests him. I don't think Sartre had very much interest for animals. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I think we do learn a lot from trying to think where the, where the continuity relies. Um, I suspect that if we accept that animals, non-human animals have, at least for some of them, a theory, theory of mind, there's some primitive I-ness of the, their own state compared to the states of others and, and watching what's going on with this other guy. So, but it's true that in the authors I'm talking about today, and especially in Sartre, yeah, we, we're in the Cartesian tradition. We're in the country. And Sartre, whatever his denials are, and indeed, as I tried to show, he thinks about I and I think in very different ways from Descartes. He's in the Cartesian tradition. He's talking about consciousness in the terms of I. And a lot of what he says is also inherited from Kant and so on, but I didn't talk about that either. And there was another, um... oh yeah, I was surprised. Why did you say? 
Okay, so anyway, so these are my answers. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hannah. Thank you. Uh, Hannah Ginsburg, Department of Philosophy. Um, thank you. That was a fa fantastic talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you to say more about why you find it, as I think you do, uh, you find it implausible that uh, I am Elizabeth Anscombe uh, isn't an identity statement. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of just, I was thinking a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's fascinating that she denies that it's an identity statement. And I was thinking about why, like what it could be if it wasn't an identity statement. And there may be a very straightforward answer to this. Yeah. But is there, um, why couldn't it be the statement, something like Elizabeth Anscombe is having this thought? Or when you sign this wonderful attestation of existence, <laughs> uh, and you say, I certify, I am <laughs> Beatrice Longness. Mm -hmm. uh, why couldn't that be equivalent to saying Beatrice Longness is signing this? I mean, I'm actually share with you, I'm sympathetic to the idea that I is a referring expression. But as I was thinking about Anscombe's view that it isn't, yeah. I started to think, well, why couldn't you kind of get rid of the referring expression? Uh, maybe you're kind of doing something sneaky by using the demonstrative and saying this. Uh, maybe somehow you can't make sense of the this without first making sense of the I. But still, I just wanted to hear what okay. your thoughts yeah. were about. Right. So, about so that's where maybe the question of language shouldn't be pushed too far because, um, okay, there's an answer I would give, but would not be hers. I'm going to give mine and then say why she's more on your side. I would say, if you say Elizabeth Anscombe is having this thought, well, suppose she says Elizabeth Anscombe is having this thought, we need to know that she means I am having this thought. And now, of course, she does think she means I am having this thought. And what she thinks she means by that is Elizabeth Anscombe is the entity um, the states of whom these ideas of states I have are ideas of. So you have to switch from the first person standpoint to the third person standpoint to understand that, yeah, it makes sense to say Elizabeth Anscombe is having this thought and Elizabeth Anscombe is me. And I think it's simpler to say, so then I'll try to say, so she does recognize that, of course, we can imagine a population that does not have I. And she recognized that in that case, even in that case, there would have to be a different way we use that one term, the proper name, Elizabeth Anscombe. One in which, in saying Elizabeth Anscombe is doing this, I'm saying it from the standpoint in which we say it using I. And there's another way I'm using it in which I say it from the standpoint in which we talk about other people. And I think it's so much simpler to then say, well, you know, in both cases. So why does she think? Ultimately, what is her, her fundamental reason to say, no, it's not an identity proposition? Because she thinks that, and there I'm going into aspects of the paper I haven't talked about, and I did mean to talk about, so I'll be quick, and then we'll can leave it at that, and we can discuss later. She thinks that, and. A term can refer if there's a mode of presentation under which it refers. And obviously, for I, 
there is no mode of presentation. Because if it were the body, then we're back to our problems about A. If it's that very intimate kind of access I have to myself, then there's, there's no really an entity that I can re-identify. So there's no mode of presentation for I. So it cannot refer. Because the classic case is, of course, if you have two terms that refer to the same entity, you have to have one that refers under the, uh, one mode of presentation, the morning star, and another that refers under another mode of presentation, the evening star, and lo and behold, they refer to the same thing. But in the case of I, there's no mode of presentation. That's why she thinks it's truer to say, well, it doesn't refer at all. It expresses a certain standpoint. And I think you really lose a lot there because the, the and partly for the reasons that have been alluded to or stated by, by the discussants, namely, and especially the, the linguist, namely, it's important that we have a term which is by itself empty. Nevertheless, that refers to an entity. We know in virtue of what? I say it. There's something that exists that it refers to. And that entity is essentially a conscious entity, but does not need to be thetically aware of it. It's essentially a conscious entity, and it is capable of acknowledging a potentially infinite number of modes of presentations under which that's what she is. And that's partly what, what Sartre says with his idea of a body in situation. I can identify myself as Jean-Paul Sartre, that's the name I've learned. I can identify myself as the philosopher just after the Second World War that just took the philosophical world by storm. I can, I'm all of those entities and how do I sort of relate to something that is this very person who says I, acts, projects her own understanding of the world. And being aware of that plurality of possible identification, I think, is, is very, very important. It's really a part. And at the same time, acknowledge, acknowledging that all those other beings I have around me have exactly the same capacity, and that's what I need to sort of adjudicate, navigate, make peace with. <laughs> Sartre thinks we can make peace with nobody, but he's wrong, and so on. Yeah. But, I don't know whether it really answers your question. But I think her, her fundamental reason is, there's reference only if there's some identifiable mode of presentation, which surprisingly enough, by I itself, we don't have. And that Sartre thinks too, but he thinks it's precisely what, now Sartre, when I said, we need Anscombe's sobriety to avoid all those crazy metaphysical conclusions, conclusions or statements, which are not really conclusions because they have no argument <laughs> leading to them except phenomenology. When I is empty, it means everything is possible for the person who says I. And of course, that's crazy. But if you understand, it all comes from this very weird term that has a very weird role. It's very important. It's the core from which we have any kind of standpoint and can recognize the diversity of our standpoints and relate them to other people's standpoint. So it's at the core of anything we think or say, and at the same time, yeah, there's no mode of presentation. That's, yeah, that's why I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I know you. Please. Yes, you I think it's me. <laughs> so loaded. Thanks for the talk, it's really interesting. So this might pretty much be related to what you were just saying, um, and I, I hope it's not a completely redundant kind of question. So I, 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 was, just, <laughs> I was just thinking about the A users, um, and it's not just a thought experiment, because you all already mentioned children, right? They, they kind of sometimes are A users, uh, or they start off sometimes, right? Anyway, mm -hmm. and then I was thinking, oh, well, another example would be people who go through uh, some sort of dissociation, maybe mm -hmm. because of trauma, right? So they, they don't talk about themselves as I did this or feel this, but they, they maybe refer to their name in talking about their mm -hmm. experience as a way of coping, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it makes me, so, so, right, so that relates to the question of what are we doing when we use the I and when we are... And when we don't use the I, right, what are we doing instead? Um, and then that makes me wonder, so connecting to what you just said, does the I refer, uh, and, and then if so, what does it refer to? 
so I wonder, I'm so weird, I wonder. Um, so mm -hmm. I wonder, does the I, by thinking about the, the dissociation cases, does the I rather, for example, establish a, a relation, sort of a relation between some kind of self and some kind of self, as opposed to say, in the second personal relation, relation when, when I say you, right? It's not just I, when I say you, I'm referring to you, <laughs> the, the conscious body, whatever, right? Yeah, I, yeah. It's not just that. It's I, I'm either establishing or, or sort of recognizing a relationship mm -hmm. between, between this consciousness and, and that consciousness. And, and it seems like I might be doing something kind of in a similar kind of structure. So when you say we establish a relation between a certain self and another self, you mean someone else who can say I. That's what you mean? Or? Um, well, I just meant what are we not doing when we dissociate? And then you talk about this, talk about myself. And yeah. For example, this. Just, just in the third person, like so, Tommy, Tommy is in, you know, Tommy so fell, or Tommy is in pain. Of course, I'm not, right? I'm not using the rule of referring to the, the I user, right? That's not happening, but mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. Something is not normal, right? Something is not yeah. right when I talk like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so those, these terms are suspicious, and I don't want to go too far with it, but I think there's a certain kind of passivity in the fact of not using I. So, for instance, so there's an example that Anscombe does give of someone who's lost the use of I, and I think she interprets it in the wrong way, and maybe that will also be part of the answer to the question that Hannah asked and that you're asking now. So she tells the story, which actually is in William James, that she didn't, uh, that she didn't invent herself. She read it in The Principle of Psychology. A character named Baldy, who was in a car with other people, and he fell, off, he fell out of the car. And clearly, he was conscious because he says, oh, somebody fell, who fell? And the interlocutors say, Baldy fell, probably indeed realizing, and that's how she describes the case, that he had lost the use of I. And he says, indeed, he replies, Baldy fell, poor Baldy, not realize I am Baldy. And she says, that's what was wrong with him. He was looking for a subject. Um, and I, is the source of the illusion of the subject in philosophy. But he had lost I. He had lost the use of I. That's why he was looking for a subject. He was looking for who fell. So uh, he was aware of falling. That, he was aware of falling having occurred. He was not aware of himself being the patient of the falling, which gets us to, to Hannah's. So what's so wrong with the with, uh, with, with Anscombe's interpretation. He's lost the patient conception of that thing of which he is aware that it occurred. And then she says, and therefore he was looking for a subject. Well, what's wrong is that if he had not lost the patient conception, he would not have this, what you call this dissociation, and that's right. He would not be looking for a subject, he would have it. Having lost the use of I made him look for who fell. And the use of I is the way of recognizing my standpoint on the situation that occurred, in this case, the patient's standpoint. So um, the dissociation is the loss of a standpoint from which you can adjudicate situations that occur, understand what kind of situations they are. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't resist trying to, if I, if I, if I may, sl slip in something about the first half of the, the, the last question. Mm -hmm. um, I was very struck by what you said about Locke and mm -hmm. the, the, the memory as framing the idea of the inner self, the mm -hmm. hidden self. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know about my past self, my past mm -hmm. life as a cobbler, e e even though no one else knows about mm -hmm. it, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I was thinking that it's sometimes said that that idea of the hidden self, the inner self, mm -hmm. is correlative with ideas like authenticity or being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that, uh, I mean, if you don't have that conception of the hidden self, then the only notion you have an, of an honest or a sincere person mm -hmm. is one who does their job. They sell you the bread. They fix your knee when you're not well. You know that, that, that kind of thing. That they do, they do what it says in the tin. They fulfil their social functions. But once you have an inner self to which you have to be true, then you can raise questions like, "Okay, here I am smoking, but is this me? Is this really me? Is this what I really want to do?" And it seems to me there's. It, it would be possible to think that that. Um, Thought uh -huh. that Ascom yeah. and Sartre agree on yeah. of um, the skepticism with regard yeah. to the idea of an internal yeah. or intimate self. I mean, it seems possible that what's wrong with that idea of an internal or intimate self is the idea that it's something there, available to your introspection, a thing yeah. that just presents itself to mm -hmm. you and it's already carved mm -hmm. out. Whereas I think we often think of eye thinking as involved with negotiation and evaluation and is this what I want to do or mm -hmm. am I doing it because somebody else thought I ought mm -hmm. to do it or is it really me that wants to do mm -hmm. this I mean people, we, we do torment over these things and mm -hmm. it seems possible well I, I just like to know what you think I think <laughs> yeah I think that's uh, exactly right um, so I think and I said this, I was too quick about this um, I think Anscombe's and Sartre's skepticism about the idea of the inner self are not exactly of the same kind. Um, Anscombe's skepticism is against the idea of an observed inner self. And in fact, she does say at some point in the paper, the only entity of which, whose identity at different times we can really assess is the human being. Of course, we have... and. Self-knowledge is the knowledge of the human being we are, and that we can assess by observing. But on the other hand, we have another access to what happens in that human being, and that's important, that's important morally, that's important for agency, but we will always have to go back to the observed human being to find the truth about that. But he does say, oh, well, introspection, he does then grant at that very point, well, introspection can be one of the sources um, so it, it's not completely absurd to wonder, is this really what I want, as you say? And for that, we will interrogate our current state yeah. and maybe also ask about, well, look, I felt differently the other day, but there are limits to what yeah. we can do, how, much, how far we can go with that. Whereas, so it, it's always, a, a, in a way, the way she is skeptical about the self is always from the observational standpoint. Sartre is skeptical about the self as a construct that also has a practical role, essentially of self-deception. So you're going to tell yourself, oh, I'm that kind of person. Yeah. Whereas the kind of person you are, you will know by looking at what you do. Uh, but again, you can always ask yourself, but so in that, in that sense, they have the same point. You can always ask, and that's always useful, but go back to reality, to what you do. And the skepticism for Anscombe is there are limits to what can introspectively observe about oneself. And for Sartre is, well, there's a lot of ethical suspicion to have about precisely the ideal of authenticity, what my authentic self is. Well, look at what you do. Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether that. No, that's great. That's mm. very helpful. I, I, you've been very patient. Thank you. <clears throat> we are Andy Graham. I was. Uh, just one binary question here. Do you believe in the possibility of a non-thetic consciousness happening outside of biology? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the question whether consciousness can be realized in non-biological systems. That's the question. I was going to say carbon or silicon. Yeah, that's it. Right. Carbon or silicon, exactly. Carbon or silicon. I myself am skeptical. That's not how I think. I heard recently a very good talk by Peter Godfrey Smith, who knows much more than I do about those questions, I agree with that part of it. and who was deeply skeptical. And it made me feel good just because he has you know, more thought through reasons to be skeptical. But that's all I can say. I don't know. I think consciousness is deeply related to being a biological entity that has an immune system in which the 
emergence to affectivity is part of the functioning of the immune system, defending oneself about the environment against it. Could a, could a silicon, a system you generate as a silicon system achieve? Maybe, maybe not. I'm skeptical, but really I'm not an expert on, on this question. Yeah. Uh, please. Uh, uh, Oh, sorry, uh, yeah. so, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> well, um, one, two, please, yeah. Okay, uh, okay. Isabella de Melenard, uh, architect. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, um, um, the post uh, Sartre and Merleau-Ponty, mm -hmm. the, the structuralist uh, stated that one is never completely fully aware and conscious of what, it's, of what he says, uh, writes, or even is. And uh, so I think they summarize it saying that human is never even at home in his, in his own house. Yeah. And I, I wanted to know your point of view about that. Uh -huh. So I didn't quite understand what you said. Uh, one is never completely aware in? One is never comp fully aware and conscious of what, it say, of what he says or, or writes. There are contradictions in the language, uh -huh. in, the, in the speech, yeah. and even in the, uh -huh. the situation of being aware. Yeah. Uh, people are not fully conscious, so I wanted to have your point of view about that, the, the structuralist uh, yeah. point of view. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with that. Um, in fact, and that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow in the colloquium talk, part of my sort of thinking about what is the role of I as an expression of self-consciousness is to adjudicate also what is the to what extent and in what ways? I mean, it's completely obvious, especially today, someone was talking about neuroscience. Of course, we're not subjectively aware of everything we think without even going to Freud's statement, the, the eye is not master in its own house. The cognitive unconscious is a different type of unconscious, but it's a thinking that goes on below the level of our awareness. But um, so I guess your question is, so you start with, I think Sartre would say, and there I disagree with, that's one of the points that deeply annoy me. Sartre would say that um, that is, to say that is to not recognize, so he's talking about, about Freud's unconscious in this case. Says Freud, uh, Freud does not recognize that ultimately when we go deep into what the nature is of someone who says I and who's self-conscious, uh, because non-thetic self-consciousness is empty, or the way it is empty is that it can generate whichever type of entity out there in the world it chooses to be. And even the Freudian unconscious is chosen. And I don't think that's true, of course. I don't think that's true, although nor, nor is the cognitive unconscious chosen, nor is actually even our conscious thinking chosen. It's there I agree with, with Anscombe. It's something that goes on. It's something that goes on in our mind and that goes on according to what I call in the paper of the most different logics of the mind, some of which are, and I take logic here in a very broad sense, way, ways of concatenating mental contents, some of which are rational, some of which are irrational. The ones that are rational, we will tend to sort of unify them and in unifying them, express them in an I thoughts. Some are, are irrational, and in that case, we may say, oh my God, something is going on in my mind. I have no idea where it comes from. Um, but even saying that would be still a way of having the ability to adjudicate what's going on that I control, what's going on that I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I agree with you. The point is there's a lot that's... Not, neither conscious nor controlled. Yes, that's true. And I, I tend to think I appears with at least the ability to control, but also can be the expression of the acknowledgement of the inability to control, which is at least the acknowledgement of a lack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm back here. Oh. <laughs> uh, Madeline Philosophy. Um, thanks for your talk. It was so interesting. So you registered some dissatisfaction with the way that Anscombe makes the connection to the body yeah. um, and the role of verification. So I just wanted to invite you to say a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, 
So it looks like, and that I think goes with the idea of there's reference only if there's a mode of presentation, and I has no mode of presentation, there's no reference. Um, it looks like in her formulation, unmediated conception, knowledge or belief, true or false, true or false, of actions, emotions, states, events, I think these are the four types of goings on she cites, in this body here, the in this body here occurs only as what would um, be a sort of, um, I don't mean salient, I, I mean relevant from an observational standpoint. Whereas all her examples are really examples where the access to the body is from a non-observational standpoint. And if the very same body can be accessed from a non-observational standpoint and from an observational standpoint, I don't see why you cannot say that what you say of this body, I'm jumping, I'm running, I, I, I will go to the movie, whatever, from a non-observational standpoint, is not said about that very same body that you can also access from the observational standpoint. So my impression is, and in that sense, OK, no, I'll stop here. That's why I'm not satisfied with the way she treats the body. I think she has available, even given what she says, another way to think about the body, not just, because her examples are exactly that. But maybe I'm missing something, and in that case, I'm very willing to be corrected. I mean, she also, the, the other thing I would think about is just, she, she has this nice line where she says, what was hard for Descartes is easy for me. Yeah. And, and it, it seems like part of what she's interested in about these um, sort of self-predications of physical attributes or mm -hmm. physical actions mm -hmm. is precisely that they're both observable third personally yeah. and the sort of thing about which one can have an unmediated conception. And it yeah. seems to me like that's a crucial pivot in her account. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that's compatible with what you were saying. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, I agree that that's what's crucial in her account and that's what I like in her account. Yeah. That's what I like in her account. I'm still, but I, clearly there's something that I resist that neither you nor Hannah find reason to resist. It's like, well, then why wouldn't we say? And I know why she said, because she's quite explicit. Because then, but again, I'm, I would be touching on parts of the paper that I haven't talked about. You know, she says, well, a logician who will insist that I refers um, will, will say, well, yes, true, of course, I refers, but in a, in a particular way, because it's immune to reference failure. And then she lists three kinds of immunity to reference failure. There's the absolute, no, there's the immunity just in virtue of saying I. And there's this, Im, the second immunity, which is that of, uh, so there's names and there's demonstrative. There's that of names like A, which cannot fail to refer to the intended referent. And then there's that of the, um, no, there's that of demonstrative, which cannot fa fail, to, no. Um, so there's the one that cannot fail to refer to the intended reverend, and there's the one that cannot fail to, that cannot confuse the intended reverend with another actual reverend. And she says, well, the logician will say, I has all three aspects of immunity to reference failure. It's absolutely immune to reference failure. But if that's the case, then the only object that can be immune to reference failure in all these ways is the self. And we've, we've shown that th this is just not a possible object, so I does not refer. And I say, well, look, the first degree of immunity in I's case is enough. The very fact that I is in use makes it immune to reference failure, even though there's no mode of presentation, just the rule. In I's case, all we need is the rule. But of course, she doesn't want that because she says, makes no sense to talk of reference without a mode of presentation. Th I think that's the crux of the issue. Like, why not? It precisely it's important that there be no mode of presentation that you can go on to ask. And so then, which kind of entity and which particular entity in the world do I identify with? I who, per se, just in virtue of the ability to say I, could be anything. But then Sartre, and that's where I stop, in my, we'd say, oh yeah, yeah, I could indeed be anything. But it's just that cognitively, in virtue of saying I, I'm, I'm not learning anything about what I am. So that, that's where I disagree. The first degree of immunity reference failure is enough in I's case. But, yeah. 
Okay, I think maybe we have time for one last. Is that, is that kind of, or is that? <laughs> All right, but please. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm just curious if you have um, any examples in Buddhist philosophy. So I've done some studying and also practice of Buddhist philosophy. Um, and a lot of this relates to Nagarjuna's yeah. teachings of uh, the Pragna Paramita. Yeah. Um, and essentially what it's saying is that the self is instantaneous at any given moment. It's an aggregate of five skandhas. You mm -hmm. have form, feeling, cognition, consciousness. Um, and I, th I think I struggle a lot with finding ways to really connect that framework and that structure to that I was proposing. What? Yes, the framework that you're discussing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's because, on a very fundamental level, whatever we're talking about in terms of perception or interrogation mm -hmm. are all part of these aggregates, which in Nagarjuna's framing are sitting sort of beneath this idea of self. And so when we talk about it or in, in your kind of framing, there's, I would, the way I think of it is it's sort of sitting on the same hierarchy. Whereas in Nagarjuna's framing, they're all just perceptions and they're all empty or anatma. And so I'm just wondering if you've done any work or any reading on Buddhist philosophy and how you find a parallel or how you uh -huh. even start to compare these two things. Because to me, they're yeah. just very, very different. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. It's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure, and this is just because I'm a bit hard of hearing everything you said. So if I miss it, just come in again and tell me. But um, so you were saying in the Buddhist tradition, the self is instantaneous, and then it aggregates. There's, so what what the what I was describing were aggregates and the, the phenomena I was describing were the phenomena that occur when we have an aggregate of instantaneous selves. Is that, that's basically the idea? Well, this is my interpretation. Uh, yeah. um, so the way I interpret it is that the self is temporary, it's an aggregate, and it's instantaneous. And so it is? Instantaneous. Instantaneous, yeah. So at any given moment, it's a concoction of all of these five things and those five things are constantly changing. And because there's constant change, there's nothing deterministic that exists within the self. And so that's why we say the self is empty or anatma. Uh -huh. So I think maybe the, the, um, the difference is that, so I'm not a specialist of Buddhist philosophy. I have done quite a bit of work on Miri Al-Bahari's book the self in Buddhist philosophy, which I found extremely illuminating because she started with, and she could read the text in the Sanskrit, in the original, and she was starting with text she was citing and analyzing from within the Buddhist tradition, and then in the second part of the book comparing with mostly contemporary analytic philosophy. The idea I got was that the idea of self I'm talking about, and in, in comparing Sartre and, and Anscom, and that's the, not the only, uh, two authors I'm interested in, but that's one way of getting into the question, is precisely uh, characterized not just as an aggregate, but as an aggregate characterized by intentionality, namely a goal. And what I remember of Miri's book, but you can correct me here, is that there is at least one trend in Buddhist philosophy which says to to become aware of your integration in the great self. So lose the small self and become aware of the integration in the great self. Lose all goal, either cognitive or agential. And then you become aware of what really is. Namely, indeed, those aggregates that fluctuate and change and, and are fundamentally, and the more you lose any kind of intentionality, the more you become aware of what really is, namely not your individual self, but the whole self in which you have those aggregates that shift. 
And yeah, it's true that in that sense, what I'm thinking about belongs to a very different tradition, where intentionality, goal-directedness, rightly or wrongly, is the essential aspect, at least of human consciousness. That's true, yeah. So it, that's a very different tradition. Um, at the same time, even in that tradition, there are attempts to try to figure out, for instance, what the therapeutic aspects are of, okay, lo lose track of everything you think is so important. And then that's the practice of meditation that even in the West has become much and more developed, that, exactly that. Okay, and if you find your thoughts focusing too much, let that go and just become aware of the fact that you're just part of something that is much greater than you. So these are very different traditions. And what I would say is, one of the, but you know, I'm there, I'm, I have to be very cautious, but I would say is from talking to people who know more about than I do about the Buddhist tradition, and from the way I think about these issues, I think the two ways of thinking, again, but th that's sort of my, <laughs> my goody to shoes way of being, they really have a lot to learn from each other, there is no such thing as being in the world without intending something in the world. And at the same time, there is such a thing, and it's desirable, as forget about your intention, just become aware. And one would be more the Western tradition, and the other would be more the Buddhist tradition. Would you agree with that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, anyway, that's my, my lame proposal. I don't know means you probably don't. <laughs> I'm still young, still figuring it out. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think the questions have made clear that, that, that that was a model of how you can take something very tightly focused and ramify through the whole of human life. And we've obviously got enough questions left over to do another hour. But perhaps we should give our speaker a break at this point. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>